Maybe you saw it. Back in February, this computer called Watson appeared as a contestant on the television game show Jeopardy. Watson, by the way, named for the founder of IBM, Thomas J. Watson, fairly trounced his two human competitors, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, the best two players in the history of the game. All in all, this so-called IBM Jeopardy challenge was a pretty cool party trick. Mind you, the idea of using such a party trick, such a gimmick, to showcase a technological marvel is hardly anything new. In 1837, in Manchester, England, at the very dawn of the Industrial Revolution, James Naismith, inventor of the steam hammer, would invite people into his foundry where he would show them his steam hammer. In his party trick, he would take a fresh egg and put it inside a crystal wine glass. And then he would set them, delicate as they were, underneath the massive head of this behemoth of a steam hammer. And then he would throw the lever, and the head would slam down and stop at exactly the point where it would crack the egg, but leave the wine glass untouched. Then he would raise up the head, remove the wine glass with the cracked egg in it, throw that lever again, and that hammer head would slam down in a crashing blow that would make the whole building shudder. That was a cool party trick. Meanwhile, while he was doing that in Manchester, England, across the Atlantic Ocean, a baby boy was born into a Virginia slave family. That boy's name? John Henry. Some 30-odd years later, John Henry would participate in his own party trick, one which would become the iconic story of man versus machine. John Henry would compete against, well, a steam hammer, hammer drilling holes in solid rock. The story's been retold countless times. But you know, there's a part of that story that's never told. And that's the part about the steam hammer. We don't know anything about it. We don't know how big it was. We don't know how much it weighed. We don't know how much power it had. We don't know how much pressure was in the boiler. Those facts don't matter. Those facts are just all lost in the mists of history. Why? Because they just don't matter. What, ra what matters rather is the impact that that steam hammer would have, literally on the landscape of the planet, figuratively on the landscape of the human experience. Now, when James Naismith did his party trick, he knew exactly how it would turn out. On the other hand, nobody knew how the steam hammer John Henry party trick would turn out. In the event, results were mixed. Of course, we all know John Henry won the competition, but died as a result. Nobody knew how the Jeopardy Challenge party trick would turn out. There were no guarantees. To watch it on television... It looked easy. It wasn't easy, I assure you. It was a long, hard road which began, in fact, with Ken Jennings. In November 2004, Charles Lickle, who was a senior manager at IBM Research, was out to dinner with his entire team. When as their food began to arrive at about 7 o'clock, everybody on his team and everybody else in the dining room just left. They all went into the bar where there was a television where they could see if this guy Ken Jennings would continue his 50-game winning streak on Jeopardy. Lickle watched it with him, and he was intrigued, and he was inspired with this idea of the Jeopardy challenge to create a computer system that could understand human language and could respond to questions accurately and quickly enough to compete and win on Jeopardy. Well, he took the idea back to IBM Research where some people took a dim view of it. Some people believed it was just too much of a gimmick, too much of a party trick for an organization, for an institution as important, as sophisticated as IBM Research. Other people believed it was utterly impossible and ridiculous to try. One fellow, Paul Horn, liked the idea, and he was the head of IBM Research. He took the idea to David Ferrucci, who managed a group that worked on question-answering technology. Ferrucci <laughs> took a dim view of the idea. He said, no, Paul, I'm not interested in pursuing this. Well, Paul Horn was persistent, and it took him a long time, but he was able to persuade Ferrucci 
to reconsider, which he did. And so Ferrucci took the idea to his team, and he said, listen, we have the opportunity here to do something memorable. We could do that. Or we could sit around here and write papers for the next five years. So I want to give this a try. I just need to know who's in with me. And so he went around the room. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in, Dave. I'm in. They were all in. But what was it that they were in for? Well, what was the state of the computer question answering art at the time? The best system they had took two hours to answer one simple question and would be wrong two-thirds of the time. So what did they have to achieve? What was the challenge? Well, the first thing they had to do was go from two hours down to three seconds. Then they had to go from being wrong two-thirds of the time to being right practically all of the time. And then they had to go from answering simple questions to responding to quirky, convoluted Jeopardy clues, and not only, but to do it actually competing at Jeopardy, and not only, but to compete against the best of the best that humankind had to offer up, and not only, to do it very publicly on television, and not only, to do what many eminent computer scientists believed was utterly impossible, and if not utterly impossible, at least the most difficult challenge in the field of computer science. That's what they were in for. That was the challenge they embraced that was the Jeopardy challenge. And to me, this was bold. This was audacious. So they set out to create a Jeopardy machine. David Ferrucci went off to Hollywood, where he explained this idea to Jeopardy producer Harry Friedman, who gave Dave a very tentative okay to allow this as yet uninvented machine to appear on Jeopardy some three years hence, which would be, well, early 2011. It was some time after they met that I joined the team. By the time I got there, development was well underway and the team had made tremendous progress. Also, negotiations with Jeopardy were well underway, only things didn't always go as smoothly there. I mean, consider, what's Jeopardy about? Jeopardy is about entertainment and ad revenue. IBM Research is about science, very serious science. Entertainment, science. Didn't always mix so well. Made very strange bedfellows. Negotiations were tricky. They were delicate. They were difficult. The whole deal to put a machine on Jeopardy almost unraveled several times. The team just continued to focus on speed and accuracy until they created a system, now called Watson, which could actually play Jeopardy. One of my responsibilities was to line up human contestants for Watson to spar against. Initially, this meant IBM researchers. But as Watson got better and better, this meant bringing in people who had actually been on Jeopardy and competed as contestants. Throughout these sparring games, Watson could at times be brilliant. At other times, a little less brilliant. I would say the craziest things, my favorite example. The response to a clue about a French bacteriologist should have been, who is Louis Pasteur? Watson's response, how tasty is my little Frenchman? <laughs> there were times when Watson would win the buzz and respond correctly to every clue in a category. There were other times when Watson couldn't respond correctly to even one clue in a category. The team called these train wrecks. They worked to reduce the number of train wrecks and make Watson better and better until they got it to the point where it could compete now against champions. And so it did. We brought in former Jeopardy! champions in a series of 55 sparring games. Watson won 39 times. That's a win record of 70%. This was a monumental achievement, but still 70% is hardly a guarantee. And oh, by the way, as good as these champions were, they were nowhere near as good as Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. Statistically, Watson could win. Watson could also very well lose. There were no guarantees. In fact, the day before the real games were played, Watson competed in a practice game against Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter and lost. 
There were no guarantees. Come the day when the real games were played at IBM Research in Yorktown Heights, New York, the atmosphere was electric. It was supercharged. It was maximum security, and there was this, this kind of cool, almost festival or carnival atmosphere, but there was this eerie blanket of tension over the whole thing. Of course, the whole team was there. IBM's biggest clients were there. A lot of IBM executives were there, including the CEO himself. All the Jeopardy top brass was there. The Jeopardy production crew was there. Alex was there with our three contestants, Ken Jennings, Brad Rutter, and Watson. All there. Everybody there to witness and participate in what for the team and for Watson was nothing more than a big maybe. Watson could win. Watson could lose. There were no guarantees. In the event, Fortune smiled on the team and on Watson. And Watson won a decisive victory. Personally? Personally. I am awed by what they achieved. I'm inspired by their boldness, by their daring, by their audacity. You know, if we can say that fortune smiled on Watson and the team, I'm sure it's because, as the very old saying goes, fortune favors the bold. You know, I think the, um, the John Henry story persists because it captures the, the complexity of this oftentimes very difficult relationship between human beings on the one hand, and on the other hand, these, these infernal machines which, which we human beings ourselves create. The Jeopardy challenge is often characterized as a man versus machine story analogous to the John Henry story. And I suppose in a certain sense, it is. And so that would make Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter the analogs of John Henry. And of course, that would make Watson the machine the steam hammers analog. Well, it's digital analog. Now, for those of you who find such facts interesting, here's some interesting facts about Watson the machine. Watson consists of a cluster of 90 servers mounted in 10 racks. The whole thing weighs about 18,000 pounds. There are 2,880 individual but interconnected processors accessing 15 trillion bytes of random access memory. It operates at 80 trillion instructions per second, draws about 80 kilowatts of power, and requires 40 tons of air conditioning to keep it cool. Oh, by the way, the human brain, by contrast, weighs about three pounds, fits in a shoebox, and consumes as much energy as is in, say, a cheeseburger. <laughs> you know what? Those facts about Watson, just like the analogous facts about the anonymous steam hammer from the John Henry story, soon enough, they'll be forgotten, lost in the mists of history. Why? Because they just don't matter. What matters, rather, is the impact that Watson will have on the landscape of the human experience. To get a sense for what Watson can do for us practically, we should consider how Watson works functionally. What Watson does is it reads and analyzes massive amounts of human language information. Then it uses its question-answering technology to retrieve precise answers from within that information. So Watson's potentially interesting in any context where there's a massive amount, a haystack of information, and where it's necessary to retrieve a precise answer, a needle, from within that haystack. Clearly, this includes the fields of medicine and law. Not to replace doctors and lawyers, but rather to help to assist doctors and lawyers to find that precise answer, that needle within a medical or legal haystack. The haystack of information used in the Jeopardy Challenge, roughly the equivalent of 150,000 books. That is a lot of stuff. Instantly accessible. You know, Right now, Watson is about the size physically of 10 refrigerators. Soon enough, Watson will be the size of one refrigerator. And soon after that, the size of a dorm room refrigerator. You know, it really doesn't matter because Watson could be accessible from the Internet. And that means accessible 
from an iPhone app. Can you imagine that? Precise, accurate, instant answers to all of the questions you can imagine from the information contained in 150,000 books. That's a lot of stuff. That's one-tenth of the total number of titles available on Amazon.com. The power of Watson in your pocket. What would you do with that? That's what we should all think about. What would I do with that? All in all, I suppose the Jeopardy challenge was quite a party trick. It was a bold party trick. But the real boldness was on the part of the team that accepted the challenge to create a machine that could understand human language and answer questions accurately and quickly enough to compete and win. Win decisively on Jeopardy. But none of that's the point. The value of the party trick was in helping to make us all aware of a technological marvel that is certain to have a monumental impact on the landscape of the human experience. Thank you.